Okay. So the, the official title of this was bringing analytics to the data, but it's really about getting your data out of jail. And I'm going to give you a feeling for both what Digital Globe had to do to solve the problem for ourselves, and then what we've been doing to bring those tools and capabilities available for others to solve the same sort of problem. And so let's start with the data challenge. We're, we're creating a, an insane amount of data as a species, uh, and it's only accelerating. 90% um, has been created in the last two years. And what's interesting about this is that most of that data is location enabled in one way, shape, or form. You've heard about um, environmental data from NOAA. Uh, there's a lot of other location enabled data that's being collected from wearable devices and from satellite imagery. And so we're one of those people who is collecting a lot of that data. Uh, this is in one day. Uh, we, we collect about 70 terabytes a day. We're actually sitting on an archive of about 80 petabytes, so comparable to what NOAA has in its holdings. Uh, in one day, we produce about 270 terabytes because we'll take our satellite imagery and we'll generate products for a variety of customers. Just to put that in perspective, we are far and away the biggest in the space relative to both the emerging and existing players. Um, Roll them all up together, we're still uh, several factors larger than all of the other commercial data sources for satellite imagery. <coughs> now, one of the reasons for that is that it's high resolution data. Uh, that high resolution data drives large data volumes. Uh, if you were to compare, for example, Landsat data over a given location, the data volume, with Planet Labs, which is one of the emerging providers, and Worldview 3, which is our latest satellite, we are in terms of data volume per unit area, nearly 2,000 times as much data as Landsat 8 and about 60 times as large as Planet Labs. So that's a challenge. And you've probably seen the analogy of uh, comparing a byte of data to a grain of rice. So the 80 petabytes that Digital Globe has um, collected over since 1999 is what? Maybe a container ship? How about 160,000 container ships, or 32 times the size of the world fleet, or enough container ships that if you made a line of them, you'd be able to circle more than the Earth's equator uh, all around. So think of that as data boulders from space that are falling from the sky, crushing any IT department. <laughs> this is a problem I'm sure Noah's very familiar with. So the problem is, if you can't use the data, it's dead to you. <laughs> so how about step one? How about just making it accessible? So back in 2007, uh, we acquired a company in the Bay Area called Globe Explorer that allowed us to take <coughs> data from our archive, from our library, and make it available on the web. So it's now serving about 100,000 users. Uh, through My Digital Globe, 30 other portals. Uh, a lot of these are users across the US government, but commercial customers as well. And they're accessing Digital Globe cloud services, which means they get access to our 16 year library. This, by the way, is just one year worth of collection. So we're collecting the world um, typically many times over. Actually, if you uh, look at a, an animation of our, our data holdings, some parts of the world are more interesting than others, and so we collect them many, many more times than others. And that provides online access to the newly collected imagery, actually as quickly as about 12 minutes after it's been collected, typically less than two and a half hours after it's been collected, as well as being able to go back into that 16-year library to do change over time. And so, oops. So the great thing about this is this is great for a class of problem where you know where you want to look and you're effectively using the imagery to look at something. But what about doing data analytics at large scale? How about making it possible to analyze at country or continent or global scale? So what I'm referring to here is extracting information from imagery at scale, so taking that 16-year uh, library 
and turning it into something that is more than just a bunch of pretty pictures. So we like to think of pictures as being heavy data. They're big files, but they're basically unstructured. Um, you take a picture, you drop it into a routing algorithm, and the routing algorithm doesn't know what to do with it. It's, it's a bunch of pixels. We're going to convert that from heavy data into big data, which is the individual vectors or the individual observations that are pulled out of that imagery that are actually usable for some sort of an analytic application. Why? Uh, because the class of problem that you can solve by looking at a picture is a show me there class of problem. I know where I want to look. I want to know everything there is to know about that oil refinery or that harbor or that pipeline. The data analytics questions are more show me where problems. So show me where remote dwellings are located. Where are all the buildings? Show me where all the vehicles are on the roads. Show me where there's new construction, not just in my backyard, but everywhere. Show me where the change is from before to after, like before a hurricane to after a hurricane. Um, heard an example of uh, show me where the shoals have changed from before to after Hurricane Sandy. And also what kind of change it is. So was it a uh, change that was there's snow on the ground and there wasn't snow on the ground, which may not be a very interesting change, or there was a building there and there's not a building there anymore, but there's a pile of debris, which is probably more interesting after a disaster. So I want to talk to you about how Digital Globe has addressed this challenge. And again, this was motivated first by getting our own data out of jail so that we could actually do something with it. We're sitting on 80 petabytes worth of data, but if you can't do anything with it, it was dead to us. So I want to talk about a few core enablers that have made it possible for us to even ask this question. The first is algorithms. So I think a lot of you are familiar with deep learning, uh, machine uh, vision algorithms that excel at pattern recognition. And uh, we've been able to apply in the last probably five years uh, some very impressive work in this space to pulling information at scale out of imagery. Uh, for example, recognizing airplanes. The thing is it needs a lot of compute and it also requires extremely large training sets. These algorithms don't come out of the box and automatically work. You need to train them on a variety of circumstances. And you don't just need to, for example, train a deep learning algorithm to recognize airplanes on pictures of airplanes. You need pictures of airplanes under a variety of conditions. Airplanes on dirt runways, airplanes on concrete, there's snow on the ground, uh, there's haze in the atmosphere. You need to train under a wide range of circumstances in order for the algorithm to actually work well. Second is crowdsourcing. And I'm going to talk for a moment about what we mean by crowdsourcing. How many people remember uh, when MH370 went down, the uh, Malaysian airliner? And uh, there was this uh, global campaign to go look at debris over the ocean to see if there was a sign of the airplane. Well, that was actually Digital Globe through um, a platform called Tomnod, which allowed for volunteers around the world to go look at pieces of imagery. Now, just because one person says, hey, I think I see the, the, the tail fin of an aircraft, doesn't mean that it was actually there. So we would take um, millions of observations and apply some statistics to enable us to determine with confidence, do you have a bunch of people who actually agree? Or are they all over the map? So why are we, why are we talking about crowdsourcing? Well, machines are scalable, but they're really stupid. And They'll do the same thing over and over again, repeatedly, but it may not be the right thing. And people are smarter, but they're a lot more expensive. And crowdsourcing is one of the ways that we can engage large communities very cost effectively to help us improve the results of the machine. So we do that for um, a variety of applications, and I'll show you some of those a little bit later. But basically, the crowd creates the training set to train the machine. And then on the back end, the crowd QAs the machine. 
And this turns out to be a virtuous cycle because each time you go through this loop, your training data gets better, your algorithm gets better, your crowd becomes more efficient, and the end result is that you can achieve very high levels of accuracy, better than you'd be able to get with machines alone, and a heck of a lot cheaper than you'd be able to get with people alone, which means that you're able to operate on these, these problems at scales that I'll talk about in a bit. Another enabler is public clouds. And I think we're all familiar with the reasons why public clouds are attractive. One of them is you store the data once. Uh, Rick talked about if you have the data already sitting there in a public bucket, you don't have to keep storing the data in a bunch of different places. You just pull it from the public bucket. You can also move the computation of the data. So you avoid having to move the data around, which avoids the network bottlenecks. You can provision the compute elastically, so you don't have to build these enormous data centers that are sized for your peak load. Oops, what happened? Uh, there we go. Uh, you enjoy the scale economics of the cloud providers because they're a lot bigger than any of us individually, and so they can afford to buy compute hardware a lot lower price than any of us would pay. But the one that's actually the most interesting for us is you're swimming in the same ocean. Why are we on Amazon Web Services? Because that's where the customers are. That's where the users are. Uh, we're seeing an increasing number of users developing their applications in the AWS environment. And if everybody's in AWS, all of these factors make the friction in enabling collaboration much less than if you're sitting in a bunch of different cloud providers and now you've got to figure out a way to move your data between one cloud provider and another. So building on those three components, uh, we developed something we call GBDX, our Geospatial Big Data Platform, that starts with satellite data coming down to the Digital Globe factory sitting up in Longmont, and with an enormous pipe into the Amazon cloud with a set of tools, and I apologize, you can't really see this, but this is storage and compute, so it's uh, S3 and EC2, with a bunch of customer tools, as well as partners, so Envy, Harris's Envy toolkit. And you'll see in a moment a number of other tools that are available to provide computation against the data. We have about 190, al is it 190 algorithms, give or take, sitting in GBDX right now? And I'll give you some examples of those in a minute. And uh, what that allows you to do is apply those algorithms to 80 petabytes of digital globe data, as well as data from a variety of other sources all swimming in the same ocean, the Amazon Web Services ocean, with other data sources to ultimately inform conclusions. By the way, this, this enormous pipe, there really are two enormous pipes. There's one which is fiber, and there's another one which is FedEx or UPS. Uh, how many people know about Amazon Snowball? Okay, so Amazon Snowball, there are these things that are the size of like those coffee urns out there. They're 70, 70 terabytes. And it's a way that you can migrate large legacy holdings of data into the Amazon cloud. So Amazon's figured out that in order to use the cloud, data has to be in the cloud. And it's actually one of the most cost effective ways of getting data into the cloud. Uh, we were really excited to see that happen. So we have this pipeline of snowballs that are coming into our data center and going out into the Amazon cloud. That's for the legacy data. And obviously for the, the current data, we're using that big fat internet pipe. GBDX was targeting multiple user personas, um, starting with the ninjas, the developers, with a set of application toolkits, uh, software development kits, migrating up to remote sensing and GIS users with, for example, ArcMap plugins, um, QGIS, and the like, migrating up to business users. And I'll talk about how we're enabling some of those business users. And finally, finished products. It's a platform model, and what do I mean by that? A traditional business model starts with a producer who creates something like a map and delivers it to a consumer who uses it. It's a very much a one-way sort of process. And for businesses, that tends to generate linear growth over time as you have to go out and find each new consumer, and there really is, there's no internal forcing function driving growth in a model like that. Platform's a little bit different. Platform, you have producers and you have consumers, but in a platform model, 
as each producer joins the ecosystem, it becomes more attractive to more consumers because now there's a building footprint extractor in the ecosystem. Now there is a stormwater runoff uh, a permeability uh, algorithm in the ecosystem. So the consumers who wouldn't have been able to use it before now are able to use it. Well, those consumers with more consumers make it more attractive for producers to be in the platform. What's also interesting is that consumers can sometimes be producers and vice versa. So, for example, a building footprint extractor may be a consumer of land use land cover, but a producer of building footprints. And what this does is generally leads to the sort of network effects that we're used to seeing coming out of Silicon Valley and exponential growth. GBDX is a platform like that. And one of the key things about platforms is they need data. You know, Willie Sutton's quote about why do you rob banks because that's where the money is. Well, anybody can build a platform, but the best algorithm in the world is useless if you don't have any data to run against it. So we're starting with 80 petabytes and we're adding data every day, uh, both ours and others. I'm going to give you a short tour of what GBDX looks like uh, from a number of user personas. Um, there's a developer, GBDX University. It has a developer-friendly API. Uh, for those of you who are Pythonites, it's designed for Python. Um, there's a web app for remote sensing experts. Uh, this one is showing you how you can select the material that you're using to feed into your algorithm. There are desktop plugins, for example, into ArcGIS for GIS users. So you consume the output within your own application. Uh, and then there's this thing called Answer Factory for everybody else, which is I want to know where there's been new construction uh, within the last six months. So that's the query. I don't need to know about ArcGIS. I don't need to know about remote sensing. I don't need to know about atmospheric compensation. Um, I just need the answer. And here's another example, uh, delivering the answer in a variety of ways. It may be as a map, it may be as a spreadsheet, it may be as a graph. Now, there are a variety of algorithms we've, we and our partners have built into GBDX, just to give you a flavor for uh, the richness of the ecosystem. Uh, here's one example, uh, aircraft density over time. So we collect imagery of airfields around the planet regularly. Uh, how many airplanes have been there? Well, we can do those sort of queries over basically the entire globe and give you a plot of aircraft density over time, over one year. How about queries that are more complicated than that? So queries that can't be answered alone with just the imagery. Uh, Rick talked about examples where just having satellite data isn't enough to be able to answer a question. So exporting that, those big data results, the, the vectors extracted from imagery, into a vector index that then allows you to combine it with other data sets to answer questions like, uh, where's new construction around the stuff that I've already found? Um, how about adding Twitter data to that? So what are people saying about the new construction around stuff that I found? And that's what uh, we call GBDX vector services. It's uh, scaled for trillions of vectors. It supports the not just find me cars, but find me cars in your buildings. Uh, it is capable of incorporating a variety of different sources. And it also lets you go back in time so you've saved your analytic results. I want to find recent tweets around my infrastructure or new OSM features around my locations. I mentioned that there's an ecosystem in GBDX and um, that's an ecosystem of producers and consumers. Uh, there's public data sources like Landsat 8, uh, the Copernicus uh, data. There's OpenStreetMap data. <coughs> there's 3D elevation data from Vricon. And there are, are other consumers of data, Facebook, for example. And I'll give you an example there where they're not only consuming, but they're also contributing back into the ecosystem. 
I'm going to double click on how a developer interacts with GBDX to give you a feeling for what we've tried to do to make it easy for our own developers and by inference other developers to develop against both the data and the algorithms. You know, the, there's a saying that um, good computer scientists are talented and energetic. Great computer scientists are talented and lazy because there's so much to do, you want to do it as efficiently as possible. So we've, um, we've taken on what we call the undifferentiated geospatial heavy lifting. Uh, we have, uh, like everybody in this business, an acronym. It's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and undifferentiated geospatial heavy lifting is the stuff that everybody has to do and nobody likes to do, like flossing or in the case of remote sensing, things like atmospheric compensation, terrain corrections, dealing with massive scale out and the like. And we've settled on Docker as the way that you can present an algorithm to GBDX. So you develop your algorithm, you Dockerize it. How many people are familiar with Docker? Okay, good. So you Dockerize it, uh, you stick it in your private Docker hub, you register it with the GBD task registry, and then you launch workflows against it. So it is um, designed to run whatever algorithm you want, third party, your own, uh, easy to add. And uh, the interface is file system and Docker. And um, I guess I'm not going to read this. Um, the way to think about it is you've taken your algorithm, you've put a wrapper around it. It's designed to be deployed into the cloud at whatever scale you need. And um, the workflow here, remember I said that we've got satellites going into the DG factory up in Longmont, a fat UDP pipe, plus the UPS trucks that are delivering snowballs. Sitting in S3, you as a developer have a new algorithm. I want to figure out let's say, compare NDVIs over agricultural land with historical uh, temperature and rainfall data to give um, the Climate Corp application. I want to be able to figure out how much fertilizer to add to this specific uh, meter square plot of land based on all that information. So you build your algorithm, wrap it in a black box, stick it in a Docker hub. Then inside GBDX, uh, we'll spin up whatever number of task workers are necessary managing to do um, the work. I'll, I'll give you a few examples of that. Uh, I think it'd probably be easier to take a look at GBDX tools. So GBDX tools is a wrapper that we've created to make the job of deploying an algorithm even easier. Um, so giving you access to a catalog, workflows, data storage, vector services, um, imagery streaming. I'll show you examples of these. Here's an example of one of the ugly things that anybody in the remote sensing business has to do. Um, it's unfortunate that we have an atmosphere because if we just got rid of the atmosphere, <laughs> Satellites in space would get a consistent view of the Earth every single time. Unfortunately, there's this stuff in the atmosphere. There's aerosols, there's water vapor, there's, I don't even know what it is over Beijing, but it looks horrible. <laughs> How about we make it go away? Well, we can. And, I mean, people who are not in the business would say, well, well of course, I mean, that's trivial, right? You, why can't you just make it go away? Well, making it go away and making it so that it represents an accurate measurement of the ground, that's actually hard. And we've put a lot of effort into standing on the shoulders of lots of remote sensing work over the years. Um, and we've put in place an atmospheric compensation algorithm that outperforms uh, Quack by a significant margin uh, and is more accurate than Flash. And it's faster than any of them put together. It's uh, Digital Globe's ACOMP. And it's basically designed to take top of the atmosphere measurements and convert them back to surface reflectance on the ground. Well, that's ugly stuff. How many people, well, maybe this audience would like to develop its own atmospheric compensation algorithm, but most people developing 
generally don't. That's in the category of flossing for most people. If they're interested in how many cars are there in the parking lot, they don't care about the atmosphere. So how about we run, want to run fast orthorectification and atmospheric compensation. Um, it's five lines of code. Um, how about we want to run it on Landsat 8? That's the code you need to run it on a Landsat 8 scene. Okay, but Walter, you know, you said this is designed for operating at continent scale. That's just for operating on one Landsat scene. How about all Landsat scenes? Okay, it's five lines of code. It's designed to scale automatically to run hundreds or thousands of jobs in parallel in the cloud. That's another example of ugly. I don't want to have to worry about what if my worker box crashes, what happens if something is in the middle state of computation. That's all taken care of. What if I want to run on the fly um, an image processing workflow on a variety of image tiles? Um, Idaho is effectively random access to uh, imagery via an API where you can decide parameters around this processing workflow. So orthorectification, pan sharpening, dynamic range adjustment, selecting the bands all on the fly and in real time. So you get pixels any way you want them. And this is what an Idaho call looks like. I mentioned scalability just to give you a feeling for some of the scale we're operating at. Um, a typical job, 10,000 virtual cores, 74 terabytes of RAM, a petabyte of rated disk, 50 GPU cores, um, and scale up from that. So let me flip to talking about some of the problems that we've been solving with GBDX. Think about GBDX as a uh, as your personal robot um, sitting behind the scenes. How about you're an insurance company in Australia and you want to provide 20 or 30 different parameters around property. You'd like to know how many stories are there in the house? Are there trees nearby? Is there a swimming pool? What's the slope? What's the roof made out of? Well, one way you could do that is you could go ask the homeowner. And maybe they'll tell you the truth, or maybe not. Or maybe you send somebody out to the property with a clipboard and have them take notes or take a photograph, and that's expensive. What if you want to do that over the entire continent of Australia? Well, that sounds pretty daunting uh, unless you apply some of what I've been talking about. And we're doing that with an Australian company called PSMA. So, just to give you a feeling for the scale here, 7.5 million square kilometers, 24 million people, nearly 20,000 images going into creating the data you see here on the left for the continent you see here on the right. So, this is what the images would look like. Can you see? Yeah, I guess you can sort of see that. So, here are the building footprints. So, we'll add building footprints at a large scale, add that to each piece of property. And so we happen to know that's the property ID, that's the address, there's the building footprint, both the lot line and the, uh, the footprint. How about swimming pools? Okay, so we figured out this one happens to have solar panels and no swimming pool. How about the roof material? So one of the things Worldview 3 has is a shortwave infrared, eight shortwave infrared bands, which are important in that they allow us to identify the material that the roof is made out of. So is it a ceramic roof? Is it a metal roof? Is it an uh, asphalt shingle roof? <coughs> so the, we happen to know this one is, doesn't look like ceramic tile. So this, all right, this is obviously a made up example here. Um, <laughs> and what about the, uh, elevation on the property. So we'll add that. How about another example? Um, you want to buy or sell a piece of forest property 
it's important as part of that transaction to know how many trees are there and what's the rough estimate of the number of board feet of lumber that you're going to be able to get. And ideally also, uh, if you want to be very specific, uh, what kind of lumber because pine is very different than oak. So the traditional approach is you send people out into the forest and they survey, sample, small areas. And the good news is you get an estimate. The bad news is that it's at about 70% plus or minus accuracy, which is not all that great. Uh, we're working with a company in Telescope that does it using GBDX that drops the error down to a few percent because it's able to look at all the data as opposed to simply sampling the data. How about drones? Um, one of the problems with drones is you don't want drones to fly into things because that's bad for the things they fly into and it's bad for the drones. It's very expensive to keep replacing drones if they're flying into buildings. So the FAA has been working to develop a low altitude air traffic control system and Precision Hawk is a company we're working with to build that using GBDX to find where are the buildings and where are the obstructions like trees, power lines uh, and the like. They combine that with their other data sets, their own secret sauce model living in the AWS environment and then they produce the data that's going to feed into LATAS, the low altitude, I think it stands for low altitude air traffic system. Here's another example that some of you may have heard about, which is uh, consumer retail analytics, Orbital Insight. They're a company out in Silicon Valley that uses imagery that we've collected over tens of thousands of parking lots. They pull cars out of the parking lots. They feed that with other data sets. Um, including weather data, as it turns out, and provide an estimate of same store sales and predictions for what quarterly earnings reports are likely to be. All done, again, in the GBDX ecosystem. And I think some of you may have seen, uh, how many people know about, how many, well, how many people use Facebook? Okay. So the answer to that in this country is a lot of hands. The answer to that in parts of the world that are developing is I don't even have internet service. So one of Facebook's goals is to bring internet to everybody. And in order to figure out where, how to bring internet to everybody, you need to know where everybody is. And there are large parts of the world that are fundamentally unmapped. So Facebook has been using GBDX along with those machine learning algorithms to map the developing world, figuring out where people are so that they can ultimately bring internet to everybody. And with that, I'm going to stop and uh, just make maybe one more announcement, which is, uh, come on up, Terry. So we've, uh, uh, we've been working with CU for a few months on an agreement, close to finalizing an agreement to make uh, GBDX available for the university.